Thanks, everybody. Oh, I guess I'm going to need the clicker. Is this the clicker? Oh, he went off with my clicker. Hi, Seth. Can I have the clicker? No, no, no. Oh, I'll get it at some point. He'll find it. I am a, uh, I, I, I lead the Creative Technologies Lab at Adobe Systems right now, where we do research in computer graphics and digital imaging. And I've also been a professor at the University of Washington for the last 17 years. And before that, I was at Microsoft Research for a while, and I was at Lucasfilm. And I'll tell you all about this as we go through the story. What I wanted to talk about today are some of the research projects I've done and some of the things that I've learned from them, some of the observations that I've had, um, which I think you'll see relate to Seth's observations and other people's. And actually, The Wizard of Oz, I realized, provides a good mnemonic for helping to remember these things, and you'll see that as we go through. So historically, in computer graphics, much of the work going on was motivated by the quest for realism, trying to make computer graphics imagery that was as real as possible. And the story has its beginnings at the University of Utah, where Ed Catmull was, where he did his PhD. And here's one of the first realistic uh, computer images of a curved surface, the Martin Newell's teapot, which became kind of the canonical computer graphics object and sort of an in-joke in computer graphics to use teapots again and again. And you can see the nice reflections. You can also see that there's something called aliasing, the staircasing around the edges. That hadn't quite been perfected yet, and that was due to sort of a low-resolution sampling. Uh, later, a few years later, Turner Witted produced this really landmark image of ray traced, of the first ray trace scene, and he gave me, this is the original image. These are the bits he computed. He gave me this version a few years ago. It's very exciting to see. And, and here, rays are being traced through objects to get refractions and off objects to get reflections. And this was jaw-dropping at the time. When I saw this image, it was just, it blew me, it blew everyone away that this was possible with a computer. It took hours and hours and hours to compute. Here's another image not so famous. Uh, this is work that I did. I was an undergraduate at Brown at the time, working with a mathematician, Tom Banchoff, and we were looking at how to visualize surfaces. This is a Mobius band that has an S-shaped cross-section. And this happens to be the, the image that I sent to Alvy Ray Smith and Ed Catmull when they were considering interviewing me at Lucasfilm. And this is sort of the image that got me my, that launched my career, got me my job at, at Lucasfilm, uh, which is great. Alvy was impressed that there was no aliasing, and, and he thought it demonstrated that I knew what I was doing. And once there at Lucasfilm, I collaborated with these amazing researchers. This was the place where computer graphics was being invented at the time. And we made this picture, which at the time, again, was a landmark image. It looks kind of chintzy today, but at the time, uh, this was the most realistic thing that had ever been done. It has the fractal mountains, it has Alvy's graftal plants, uh, and has a double rainbow. And most importantly, if you look really closely in the corner there, it has ripples in the puddles, and that's the part that I did. That was my contribution to this image. <laughs> and then later, Alvy directed probably the first um, uh, animated short with, the, with real characters in it. Um, and and to, to, to sort of push the realism even further, we all took walks together in the woods of Marin. I remember them well. And we looked at you know, just what kind of complexity was going to be required in order to model all of the leaves and the, and the grasses and so on. And this took millions of polygons, had to be rendered on a Cray XMP, took weeks and weeks and weeks to uh, complete. Meanwhile, or sort of around the same time, the, the simulation of reality got even more scientific at Cornell. And there, people started doing experiments where they would construct actual boxes, and then they would make the computer graphic simulation of those boxes, and they would take a photo of the box and compare it with the simulation and do actual measurements to see just how close we were coming. And I joined Cornell a little bit later. I did a one-year visiting faculty uh, position there after my PhD. And I also participated in this sort of quest for realism at that level too, trying to, trying to look at the science of it and the physics of it and so on. And this is one of the papers that we published. And you can see there's all kinds of equations and so on. And what I found is that while I could do the physics, I didn't really like doing the physics the way that you know, everyone else there did. And this brings me to sort of the first observation of in my talk, which is that 
I think it's very important in choosing your research area to follow your heart, to not necessarily do what everyone else is doing, but to think about what is it that you are really good at and how can you take advantage of what it is, of what your natural talents are, to do something maybe different from what everyone else had done. And so when I started my career at the University of Washington, I thought, you know, I could keep doing this physics stuff. I can do it. I'm not really excited to do it. What is it that I really love? And I realized that what I loved was art. I had taken studio art classes as, a, as an undergraduate, as a graduate student. I'd done photography and painting and printmaking and drawing. And I thought, I wonder if there's some way that I can use that talent in computer graphics. And as, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that, hey, actually, illustrations do have some advantages over photorealism. And maybe this points to an interesting research agenda that would be a little bit different from what everyone else has been doing, but still a, a useful subject to explore. And so some of the advantages are that illustrations can omit extraneous detail. So if you want to describe, say, how something works, you can add annotations and so on without distracting with an image that's too realistic. Or they can help focus a viewer's attention. So in this pen and ink drawing, your eye naturally goes to the upper part of the image where more detail has been added instead of having to direct your attention with like an arrow or something else that you might have to do. And they're always used in medical text to clarify and simplify shapes. And they're great at exposing parts that are hidden. Here's a, uh, a Honda brochure that I got around that time. I was looking, I was shopping for a Honda and this is very inspiring. And they're also great at showing that an idea is still approximate, that it's not a completed thing. And architects use them all the time to show that this is a concept. This is not the actual building you're going to have, but it's a concept, and it conveys that. So the challenge became, how can we use graphics, not necessarily to get photorealism, but to communicate more effectively? And the place that we decided to start was a place that that has a lot of existing conventions, pen and ink illustrations of architectural models. And the challenge here is that up until this time, all computer graphics was done with this sort of realistic shading. So if you wanted something lighter, you'd just make it lighter. But with pen and ink, you can only draw with a black, a black ink on paper. So how do you make it lighter? You can't just turn it gray. Well, we studied the way that pen and ink artists worked. And, and we noticed that if they wanted a light area, and here's a laser pointer would be nice, but Maybe I can try using this thing. No, it doesn't work. If they wanted a light area, they would just start drawing with a few strokes, like the outlines of the bricks. Here we go. And if they wanted it darker, they would add some texture inside the bricks. And if they wanted it darker still, they might hatch over the bricks and so on. So we built a kind of procedural rendering system that could start with a 3D geometry, just like realistic rendering would, and render it in pen and ink by using pen and ink strokes sort of in this prioritized order to get any kind of shading. So here's the kind of image that this system would produce. And you can see that uh, uh, it's all shaded in pen and ink. You still get a sense of the tone everywhere and the texture of the materials. And it's also added, oops, added some things to help clarify, like these dividers here. It's added outlines between areas that have very similar colors. And that you wouldn't see in a photorealistic rendering. After pen and ink, a natural progression was to work on watercolor illustration. And here, actually, I used some of the background in physics that I had sort of learned at Cornell. We actually did a physically-based fluid flow simulation in order to get this sort of non-photorealistic effects of watercolor that watercolor artists are interested in. So we were sure to be able to simulate all the kinds of wet and wet painting and glazing and drawing on the paper and so on. And one of the things that you can do with this, you could have an interactive system that would let you paint with watercolor. Another thing you could do is you could start with an image and watercolorize it automatically. So the computer simulation would look at that image, it would divide it into sort of glazes, and for each glaze it would decide where it needs more water to make it lighter or where it needs, needs more pigment to make it darker. And here, hopefully, is a little animation of this thing progressing. Let's see. Yeah, so this is the computer simulation of that watercolor and it's done at low res. I'll show you the high resolution image in a moment. But you can see where it dabs on more water or more paint in order to continue the image. Is there any water up here? There is, good. So here's the high resolution watercolorized result of that image. So the second observation here is that it's worth having the courage to leave the mainstream 
I, I should mention that, that that was a whole new area. I mentioned that, but that work in non-photorealistic rendering eventually grew into like a whole subfield with lots of hundreds of researchers publishing papers in that area year after year. Now there's an annual conference um, on non-photorealistic rendering that takes place with like 100 people coming to it. And it all sort of grew out of going off, following my heart in a completely different direction and having the courage to do something different. And uh, as Seth was mentioning, being an outsider kind of helps too. It uh, gives you a new kind of perspective. So don't be afraid that you don't know anything about the subject. It's actually quite useful to go off in a, in a new direction. So a after everybody was doing this kind of thing, I became a little bit bored with it and wanted to see whether there was some way we could, instead of studying every single kind of illustration effect and trying to implement it directly, was there a way that we could have the computer just r reason by analogy? So if I gave it, say, an image and a watercolor image, and then some new image B, could the computer generate this B prime directly just from that pair of images and the new image B? And in fact, it can do that. It uses a kind of a texture texture synthesis approach where it takes little bits of A prime and puts them together into B prime, sort of wherever B is in correspondence with A. And so it turns out if you start with a grayscale image and a pen and ink stippled image and you give it B, it'll just automatically produce this stippled result. Or you can use it for other things like enhancing the resolution. If you give it a, a blurry image and a sharp image and a new blurry image, it can sort of hallucinate the whole rug at higher resolution. And here's sort of my favorite uh, application. This is one that we didn't do. After we published the paper, we put the software online, uh, a guy who worked at a flight simulator company in Finland took the work, and he put a topo map in for A and a satellite image he had that corresponded to it for A prime. And then he put in some new topo image where he didn't have the satellite imagery and let image analogies produce analogous satellite imagery, which he then put into his flight simulator. So now he can fly over sort of any terrain that he has topo maps for. So the next observation I have is about posing your problems. When PhD students come in, they think that they're going to learn how to solve hard problems, and they do. That's a big part of doing your PhD. But I think more important than learning how to solve hard problems is learning how to pose them wisely. Because after all, you're going to be working on these problems for months, maybe even years. If you end up working on a problem that's just not that interesting, you've spent years of work solving this problem that wasn't that interesting. Much more valuable to find a good problem in the first place. And that's a skill that, that I work very hard to teach my students. And it's one of the hardest things for them to learn. And it's kind of what I look for to see whether they're really ready to graduate with their PhD or not, is can they pose problems well? So I taught a class in posing and solving hard problems, um, actually a few classes like this. Each year that I did it, it would have a theme. And one year I did it with a theme of ornamental patterns and tilings. And the motivation for this, or the inspiration behind this, is that our sense of aesthetics, I think, and others think, is grounded in the natural world. It's kind of like Stone Age man. What's good for you aesthetically is what we grew up with in the Stone Ages, which was not modern surroundings and so on. It was nature. And so here's just a few pictures from my travels, recent travels of nature. And anthropologists have written about this, that humans were evolved to require these things. Simply eliminating, eliminating them creates a serious psychological deprivation. Social systems that disdain or discount beauty, form, mystery, meaning, value, and quality, whether in art or in life, are depriving their members of human requirements as fundamental as those for food, warmth, and shelter. And this problem is getting worse because more and more people are moving into cities. So if you look back in 1800, only about 5% or less, maybe 3% lived in urban areas. But in the last year, we've actually reached a threshold where for the first time in the history of civilization, more people live in cities now than live outside of cities. And that trend is projected to continue. So uh, here, for example, is a city. Does anyone know what city this is? This is Tokyo, right, very good. Amazing crowd here. Um, so modern buildings are devoid of the kinds of ornament that we used to have in our older buildings. And similarly with books, the earliest books were all uh, illuminated by hand. But around the time of the printing press, 
this, this kind of ornamentation went away. And nowadays, it's much easier to create books than it ever was before, yet we don't have any tools for ornamenting the page. Oh, I wanted to mention that Bill Mitchell, Dean of Architecture at MIT, once told me that when he sees a modern building, he can tell what tool was used to design it, uh, almost always. And so the things that we build really are reflections of our tools. So the challenge then is how might we use the power of the computer to bring ornamentation back into modern design. And the first problem we looked at was floral ornament. So whenever you've got a big problem like ornamentation, a good approach is to sort of narrow it down, first of all, and think about a narrower version of the problem. So we looked at floral ornament within panels. Whoops, I jumped ahead there. And so we would take, we found an, an algorithm, it's fairly straightforward, where you'd have an ornament that's already grown to some point, and now to extend the ornament, you look for the biggest open space, or the biggest yellow circle here, which happens to be right there. And then you evoke a rule, which is dependent on the type of ornament, to grow into that space. In this case, it grows with a leaf. And the different rules for growth give rise to different ornaments. So here are four different ornaments. Uh, this is based on William Morris's willows. This is based on spirals. This is from a Chinese vase. This was from the coffee mug that was on my desk. And we basically de describe rules for growing and filling space with these ornaments. And so here are those four different kinds of ornaments elaborated over different regions. And here's the paper that we published. I always believe in trying to use our work. <laughs> so here we have the, the ornament around the front page of the paper. A second project in this class was motivated by M.C. Escher. Escher, at the age of 24, visited the Alhambra, and he was inspired by the beautiful geometric Islamic star patterns there. But he thought it was a shame that the Moors were forbidden by their religion to depict human or animal forms, and so he set about developing his own layman's theory so that he could develop these beautiful, memorable tilings. And so I asked the, the, the class this question, can a teapot tile the plane? The teapot, of course, the canonical computer graphics object. And this really is a research question. I had no idea whether a teapot could tile the plane. And so to solve this problem, uh, we learned about tilings. Um, there's, turns out there's a class of tilings called isohedral tilings, of which there are 93 different types. And we had to figure out how these tilings could be adapted or parameterized so that they could be deformed and still stay tiling. So this is like the basic tile, this hexagon. But it turns out you can pull on this edge, you can pull on this edge, and turn it into this overall shape, and it still tiles the plane. And then, so the approach that we used, I should go back and say the approach we used is rather than try to squeeze a teapot into a tile, it's much easier to start with something that you know is a tile, like a hexagon that tiles the plane, and then deform that into the teapot. That's basically the approach that we used. And so here's a shape, for instance, the shape of the sphincter. And we're going to start with this tile that we know tiles the plane, and we're going to push and pull according to the ways that we learned that you could do it in order to get the final form as close as possible. And it turns out, as I said, there are 93 different types of tilings. That's a big number, but not such a big number for a computer. So we're going to have the computer try all 93 different types and simultaneously push and pull and prod those types to try to get closer. And eventually, some of these types just aren't going to work that well, so it'll throw some of them away and continue with the ones that remain and throw the, all but the best ones away and then finally arrive at the final closest tiling. So here might be the tiling of the thinker. And then you would texture map it with the thinker. So let's see a few results. Um, can tux tile the plane? Sure enough, uh, you can find a nice tiling for tux. How about a teapot? Uh, turns out, yeah, teapots actually can tile the plane as well. And actually, here's Escher's own self-portrait. That also tiles the plane, as it turns out. <laughs> so we did lots of these. So the, the third project and final project was on Islamic star patterns, actually, themselves. And they're a very interesting problem because there are beautiful examples all over the Islamic world of these star patterns, all over mosques and the Alhambra and so on. But it's, it's now a mystery how they were done. It was a carefully kept secret, uh, the design of these things. It was passed from master to apprentice and then lost over the ages. But interestingly, we can now apply modern mathematical theories to sort of discover how they were done. And we built a kind of a Islamic star pattern ornamental design system that lets you start with a different classes of tilings, which we called inflation tilings, and use those as kind of a scaffolding to elaborate the pattern. 
So here are a couple of uh, star patterns that we created. We were very excited. We submitted a paper to SIGGRAPH, and of course, it was rejected. SIGGRAPH is not easy to get into. We worked on it really hard, polishing it, making it much better for another year, still rejected a second time. And so then we thought, all right, what are we going to do? And we decided to extend it. Um, and so what we did is we, if you throw away Euclid's fifth postulate, which is a postulate about parallel lines, and just don't come up with a formulation that doesn't involve that, you can actually create star patterns that work over the sphere or work over the hyperbolic plane equally well. So these are uh, star patterns that work over, over the sphere and over the hyperbolic plane. This is the Poincaré projection of the hyperbolic plane. And that brings me to observation four, which is that to solve hard problems, obviously you need to keep persevering, and I think Dorothy is the perfect uh, representative of this, and strong collaborators really helps as well, which Dorothy also had. <laughs> Finally, uh, bringing this full circle, uh, actually Nathan Mirbold, who was a former speaker at EG, apparently, um, was designing his house at the time and had bought this water jet cutter so that he could make a very special heating grates and, and shades, and he had heard about our work, and so he took our design system and designed his own Islamic star patterns, which he then cut with a water jet cutter out of metal and wood and used that in building his house. So the final observation that I want to leave you with is that uh, while we, in life, it's really easy to, to, or it's very human nature to try to avoid hard problems, I think they're worth embracing, whether it's in research where what you need is a good hard problem, you can't get your PhD without it, or in life where the good hard problems are going to come and find you, whether you like it or not. Uh, this is where we really grow, this is where we really learn. Um, if you can't go to sleep at night, it's a great opportunity to, uh, <laughs> to embrace your hard problems and figure out how, how to solve them. Thank you.